problem. Donald Trump made dishonesty acceptable in the Republican Party. Donald Trump made blatant lies acceptable in the Republican Party. And I can tell you that before the election, there were Republicans who knew, because there were rumors out there, this guy's shady, uh, we don't really know about him, we don't know if everything he's saying is true. Wait, so are you talking about Santos or Trump? Which one are you talking well, about? <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about Santos. I'm talk I'm talking about the more recent case, which is George Santos. So, uh, and Republicans went ahead and uh, looked the other way, and many actually ended up supporting this guy. So the party does have to kind of reevaluate its standards. Now, hopefully, as Donald Trump fades uh, in the back view mirror, uh, and uh, it's just absurd that they went ahead and supported this guy anyway, and that some are tolerating his service in the House. Uh, it, it, it's unimaginable, just like it's kind of unimaginable that Democrats and their research uh, uh, arms did not uh, find any of this before the election. Right. There, there are a lot of oppo teams hit, hitting their head against a, a wall tonight. You know, here's the thing, which is I, I, I was talking about Santos and I said misleading statements that he has apologized for this. I'm going to put misleading statements in like the biggest air quotes ever, yeah. because we're talking about really substantive lies here, some of which um, this New York Times article showing an unregistered fund that raised money for Santos and that efforts to elect Santos may have skirted campaign finance rules. You tweeted that there are about a dozen federal campaign finance by violations described in that article. Tell me more. Look, w when you run for Congress and, and you do it successfully, you become aware of all of the, the prohibitions on coordination, for example, with super PACs. He cared about none of those rules. I, I mean, this is someone who basically, his, whose campaign became one and the same with the super PAC that he was raising money for, except it turns out that the super PAC didn't even exist. Like, it wasn't even registered under the... F <laughs> It wasn't even registered through the FEC. Uh, and, and maybe, by the way, that is the source of where he got some of the income that he ultimately reported. Maybe the money that he was directing people to donate to this fake entity was money that was actually going to himself. And so I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up learning about that. And I don't want to be clear to our viewers. You and I both sort of laughed as you said that because it is so flagrant. And it is so unimaginable. I mean, there are entire teams of people who are hired not just to raise the money on a campaign like this, but also to vet, to make sure it's going into the right fund, that it's coming from the right people. I mean, this is complicated work and rules that people are supposed to follow. Most candidates hire attorneys to advise them on how to avoid FEC uh, violations. And, you know, not only did he appear not to have done that, but he appeared to have created this fake entity, and it's one of many lies. The thing is, there, there, any subset of the things that he has said uh, are, uh, is enough for him to, to resign. But that's not going to happen so long as the seat can flip to a Democrat like Tom Suozzi, for example, who I'm sure would love to run for this seat if it became available. Right, and that's the macro politics of it, Congressman Carmelo, which, which you know, we'll come back to. But I also, I want to remind everyone, that, I mean, this guy has constituents in his district, I want to play some sound from MSNBC of voters who live in Santos's district. Take a listen. I want this man out. I want him out. He had the nerve to say that in two years you can vote me out. I don't answer to politicians. I answer to my constituents. Well, I'm one, and I want him out. McCarthy, I don't care if you want his vote. You're losing all the other people's votes when you do this. I mean, it's, it's garbage. I mean, at this point, I think our, our audience, whether you're so well read in on the politics of this, where in New York State, they really felt the Republican Party that they were making gains, Congressman Carbello, they are frustrated because they do not want to see Santos jeopardize the inroads that they feel that they have made. And that is why you have a bunch of Republicans from New York saying this guy has got to resign. The, what you're hearing from Republicans in Washington, D.C., specifically leadership, sounds a little different. At, at what point do they decide they can't stand with him any longer? Well, Alicia, the real tragedy here, I think you put your finger on it, is the voters of that district uh, in Long Island, because those voters essentially have no representation in Congress right now. No one, Republican or Democrat in Congress, takes George Santos seriously. No one will work with him on any legislation. Republican leadership does find him useful because the margin in the House is so tight. If Republicans had a 30 or 40 seat majority, they would have waved goodbye to George Santos a long time ago. So right now, 
The only purpose that George Santos is serving in Congress is protecting that very slim Republican majority. When the numbers are so slim, you have to worry about flight cancellations, people getting sick, people having bathroom emergencies during votes. So that's <laughs> his only purpose in Congress right now. And that's a disservice to the people of his district. And, and as you said, even for the Republican Party uh, of Long Island, of the state of New York, that that did make significant inroads in that state uh, this year. This is going to set them back because it's a major embarrassment. And the longer he stays in Congress, the longer and deeper the embarrassment will grow. So, I mean, Congressman Jones, this is, this is a piece of what we watched happen this week. You also saw a bunch of bills advance around um, limiting abortion and access to reproductive care. I think next week we're going to watch to see whether or not the debt ceiling is actually raised. And then, of course, it's all happening along the backdrop of investigation palooza. So if you are Democrats and you're sort of bobbing and weaving through all of that, what then is the core message, understanding that there's very little you feel you can advance through Congress? Uh, I would add that after passing that rules package that gutted the Office of Congressional Ethics, the next thing they did was attempt to gut the IRS so that their billionaire donors could continue to evade paying their taxes. Well, convincing <laughs> their most working class and middle class donors that the IRS is actually out to get them. Listen, I don't, I don't know that they are succeeding in convincing people. I think the argument is, is clear to most people if you put the effort into explaining to them that the reason they're trying to take away these IRS agents is because they're now going to go after billionaire tax cheats, and that was what the Inflation Reduction Act was about doing. By the way, these are people who ran on reducing the deficit, well, that's been scored, this legislation that they passed through the House that, thank God, is not going to pass through the Senate. And it turns out that they're adding to the deficit. So their ideas are not popular. This is the natural consequence of electing people who don't believe the federal government should really exist outside of cutting taxes for wealthy people and maybe passing a national abortion ban that they're trying to walk back from. So we should not be surprised that all of the things that they are doing are deeply unpopular. And especially now that Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates and others like them are running the show, we're going to continue to see crazy stuff from this GOP.